is there evidence of a global flood? Because if something covered, if water covered the entire world at some point, there should be evidence of that. Now, one of the things that I hear a lot is that um, people that are trying, Christians that are trying to kind of um, go along with what the world says, but also believe what the Bible says, will say, well, maybe the flood was just a local flood, okay? It didn't cover the entire world. It just covered the area in which Noah lived. So I want to address that first, because I think that's an important issue to talk about. Um, it actually occurs a lot in the study notes of Bibles, but we have to remember the study notes are not the inspired and errant word of God, okay? And so, um, and really those ideas are coming, as we'll see, from outside the text, and they're trying to push ideas into the Bible that the Bible clearly does not indicate or state. So if the flood was local, okay, these are just some basic questions I have to ask. Why did Noah have to build an ark? Because seriously, he could have went somewhere else <laughs> um, where the flood was not going to happen. That seems like a lot of energy, a lot of time and effort wasted when he could have just went to wherever the flood was not going to occur. Why did God send animals and birds to the ark? Because again, he could have just sent them somewhere else. I mean, a year long like survival cruise was probably very stressful to the animals and hard. Oh, and it wasn't necessary if it was a local flood. They could have just went elsewhere and been okay. But my third reason for, not, for having a really hard time with the local flood and not believing a local flood is remember, after the flood, God sent a rainbow, right? He put a rainbow in the sky and said, this is my promise, I will never do this again, right? Have there been lots of local floods since Noah's time? Sure, we all know that. We experience a lot in this region because of the Ohio River. All right, so if he said he'd never do it again and Noah's flood was a local flood, God has broken his promise many times over, right? I mean, because there's been lots of local floods since then. So that's a problem. Noah's flood can't be local because God doesn't break his promises and he doesn't lie. <laughs> so we have to, we need to really think about that and understand that in that context. And scripture makes it clear. Again, just like we know the size of the ark, we know that the flood covered the entire world. It says, all flesh on the earth, everything, all flesh, everything shall on the earth shall die, right? Even says all the high hills, not some of them, all of them were covered by 15 cubits of water. That's about 23, 25 feet above the um, highest hill. So if it's a local flood, how does that work? Right? Think about that picture for a minute. Some of you are chuckling, you get it, right? So if it's a local flood, what, seriously, it's just going to go 15 cubits upward of the closest, of the highest hill in the area? No, does water work that way? I mean, when you turn it on in your bathtub, do you think that bathtub is going to stop it? The edge is going to stop it from going over? No. Okay. If the water keeps coming, it's not going to, it's going to continue to all those areas. It's going to seek its own level. So that isn't possible. Plus it says all the high hills under the whole heaven. It doesn't say just in the area where Noah lived. Um, and again, scripture is clear. These verses are not hard to understand or interpret, right? It says what it means. All flesh died, every, every, all, only Noah and those who were with him in the ark and remained alive. And if we had time, we could go to the New Testament and I could show you passages there where Jesus himself stated these things, okay? So it's not, again, this isn't hard to understand. And the New Testament writers, including Jesus himself, understood it to be a global flood that killed every everything, land-dwelling animal and human except those which were aboard the ark. Now, because as Christians, we have a reasoned faith. We do not have a blind one. So in other words, what we, we know certain truths from God's word, so we expect to see certain things in the world. And we see those things, and those things confirm and support that God's word is true, all right? So we should expect to see things um, like certain, like we're going to talk about in the relationship to rock layers and the fossils, okay? And this is just two. There's a lot more, and we're only going to talk about a subset even within this. But let's talk about these as being major flood evidences. Now, probably many of us are familiar with geological timescales that look like this one, that the lower you go in the rock layers, the older that, that, that rock is, the older the fossils are. And as you go more towards the surface, the younger they are. And there are certain, you know, fossils associated with different levels. Now, here's the question. Does it really take millions of, rock, millions of years for rock layers to form, or can they actually form quickly under the right conditions? Okay, that really is the question that we have to address. 
So I'm going to show you a short video that talks about the Mount St. Helens eruption that occurred in 1980. And most of us in the room, maybe with the exception of the kids, um, remember um, that, watched it on TV probably, because thank goodness volcanoes don't erupt every day in the U.S. Um, and uh, what we saw was that, wow, under catastrophic conditions, things like rock layers can actually form very, very quickly. So let's take a look. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons, canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock in just days of cutting time. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. and vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade. Similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. Okay, so what this showed was that under catastrophic conditions, you can get a lot of change in a short period of time. Um, they showed these rock layers that were here. Um, you see the person at the bottom for an idea of how big, how many rock layers are there. Those rock layers were formed in a matter of hours. It did not take millions of years. All it took was the right conditions. Uh, they talked a little bit about this canyon. This is called Engineer's Canyon. It's 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. It was cut out in nine hours. That's all it took, right? It just took a catastrophe. Now, there's a little um, river that runs through that canyon. And I'm going to tell you right now, that river didn't make that canyon, right? Because we know. We observed it in the present. It just took nine hours to carve that out. Now, I would say the same is true for the Grand Canyon when you go there. Now, when you go there, they'll tell you the Colorado River carved that out over millions of years. Nope, it did not. There's no way. It would not look like that. It looks a lot like it happened very, very quickly not that long ago. One of the evidences of that is the fact that there's the faces of the canyon are very steep, okay? And they don't look like they've been weathered away for millions of years, right? They're much more recent because they're the result of a probably a post-flood catastrophe that carved that out in probably just a very short period of time as well. Now, let's go on and talk about the fossils. And one of my favorite things to deal with with fossils um, is talking about soft tissue, okay? Stretchy soft tissue that we find inside um, dinosaur bones, okay? Because it combines biology and paleontology. And so that's what I love about it. So there, um, this finding was first uh, discovered sort of back in about 2005. I should say it's one of the really popularized. It had been discovered before that, but um, the more and more our techniques got better, people were able to see this. And so what they found, what you're seeing here is uh, dinosaur soft tissue. So this is blood vessels right here. That's what these are. 
And the things inside the blood vessels are exactly what we would expect. These are red blood cells. Now, um, of course, when you see something like this, it's like, well, is it real or is it just an artifact of something that they did to the fossil? And so what they did was they did protein analysis of these structures to say, are they really what we think they are or not? Turns out they are, okay? They have the exact proteins we would expect to find in blood vessels and in red blood cells. And they have done a lot of research on this over the years to show what looks like almost fresh bone. I did a lot of work on bone biology for my graduate study, so I know what it should look like. And it looks, a lot, fresh bone looks a lot like this, only this is supposedly 65 million years old, okay? Um, some people even say that when they do this soft tissue analysis, it even has a smell to it, which is not something you would expect, okay, from something that is that old. It just should not be in this state if it's that old. And, and they found it in, in dinosaur bones that are much older than this, that are up to like 125 million years old. And they're finding it basically in every dinosaur bone they look at, all right? So how do they deal with this? Because these types of structures they know can't, shouldn't be here after millions of years. So I want you to listen to Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who's one of the first um, scientists to really popularize this find and help people understand it. And listen to what she says about her discovery. I'm not gonna believe this. When she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched and it sproined and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels, and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it, that's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump inducing scientific moments, that's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. Or is it? <laughs> is it really that old or not? Um, so as a biologist, I worked a lot with DNA and tissues and cells. And trust me, even under pristine conditions, um, they don't last that long, okay? They don't even last that long in our observable time um, that we can see. So it's clearly a problem. And notice she says, I don't believe it. That's not possible. You need to do it again. Because they're like, no way. We know this tissue can't last millions of years, yet here it is. So what do they say? How do they try to deal with this in their worldview? They would say, well, look, it can last millions of years. Not, oh, maybe it's actually a lot younger, okay, which is what this would definitely indicate. They say, nope, millions of years is absolutely true, even though, again, that's based on their ideas about the past, not on God's word, who saw everything happen, was an eyewitness to creation, and inspired man to write that down. That's based on their ideas. They're going to keep on believing that in spite of the evidence, okay? They're trying to find a way that these things could be preserved over millions of years. Now, they haven't had much luck, um, and they're not going to, because this isn't plausible in a millions of years scenario. It's only plausible if these things are a few thousand years old. Now, creationists have been doing research in this area as well, and this is an electron microscope image taken of a triceratops horn that has been conventionally dated to be millions of years old, and they find these cells there called osteocytes. These are mature bone cells, and osteocytes have a lot of these little tendrils that come off to the sides. They're very fragile. They break very easily. I would not expect to see them in something that's millions of years old, okay? They just shouldn't be there. In fact, this shouldn't even look like a cell. It should just be totally obliterated because of the time factor there. And yet, there it is. And just to give you a comparison, this is the bone from the triceratops horn, and this is fresh bone. It is actually very difficult to tell the difference um, because they, they do look actually quite similar. Again, not something you would expect if that bone is millions of years old, but if it's only a few thousand years old, you would definitely be much more likely to expect that, which shows that these fossils were buried as a result, most of them were buried as a result of Noah's flood, and they're just a few thousand years old. Now, that's just two, and obviously there are many, many more that point to a global catastrophic flood that occurred just a few thousand years ago.